If you will, please turn to Psalm 19. Uh, We've discussed the first six verses last week of God's revelation. That means how has God revealed himself through nature. Nature shows that God is God. We discussed how nature proves that God is real. And we discussed how it leads to a worship of the one true God, not many gods or anything like that that it does lead to a knowledge or at least a recognition of God, Yahweh, that we worship in Scripture. Now we look at a different form of revelation. This revelation is not based on merely nature, but on something greater that we are given that generations before us never had. Uh, It is this right here, the Word of God. And what I mean by this is that Uh, this was not given to common man like you and I until relatively recently in human history. If you recall before a time of computers, they did not have the technology to mass produce God's word and give it to the people. More than that, it wasn't in a common language that most people spoke. Now you have multiple English translations to look at and to choose from, this is a relatively new thought. Before it was only those who could speak Latin or Greek and Hebrew that could read the Bible. And they would tell you what the Bible says, but you would never be able to hold it in your hands and thumb through it the way that we have it. You certainly wouldn't be able to whip out your phone and to follow along with it like many of you do. I prefer the smell of a real Bible. I prefer the feel of a real Bible. And this is something that is special. And that's why it is called special revelation. It is revelation of God in Scripture. And that's what Psalm 19 begins in verse 7. We saw the first six talking about how he reveals himself in nature. Now it's getting into how he reveals himself in this, in this book. Look there at Psalm 19, 7 through 11, and follow along. It says, The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this opportunity to study your word and to see what Psalm 19 has to say about the blessing of Scripture in our lives. God, help us revere it as it ought to. Help us love it as we ought to. It is in Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. What we see in the first six verses of Psalm 19 is that natural revelation displays God's glory. However, now we see in verses 7 through 11, that special revelation displays God's grace. And that's a very significant thing because you can come to a knowledge of who God is and know that you are inadequate to be before him through just the very power of nature around us. However, you do not understand the grace and the love of God until you discover it in this book. And so that's why it starts off in verse 7 here, The law of the Lord is perfect. There is nothing hidden from the sun's heat, is what verse 6 says. And the very next one is saying, it's perfect. The law of the Lord is perfect because it revives your soul. In a desert country like Israel, in which David, the writer of this, and the king of Israel knew, the sun would sap you of your energy and leave you wanting to die in the middle of the desert if you were exposed to it too much. 
You perhaps have felt that way. I know I have felt that way many times on our last mission trip to Mayfield, Kentucky, and that humidity. I am not a roofer, ladies and gentlemen, and I was up on the roof, uh, and, and Daryl did it for a little bit of time. I can handle it. It was tough. It was hot. Before we did any work up there, I was dripping wet, and I was so tired, it was hard to move. I'm not joking when I say this. The sun's heat is so powerful, yet the law of the Lord is perfect that it restores your soul. It brings you refreshingness in a life. Because what we are under the, the wrath of God, under the pure holiness of God, is sinners. We are all sinners. But here in the law of the Lord, there's grace. There is a chance to be revived and have our souls be brought up. We are flawed, yet there is a message in here for forgiveness for flawed people. And I want to make this clear because I think it is a very hard thing for the world to believe. But God wants all people, every single person in this world, to have a relationship with him. And when I say that, I mean the people who are addicts, who are alcoholics, the people who are homosexual, the people who are transitioning from a man to a woman or a woman to a man. God desires to have a relationship with them. And I don't believe there's any sin that's too far gone for God to say, no, I'll pass. He wants that relationship. The law of the Lord is perfect. In Scripture, we find that message of forgiveness. Romans 6, I talked about during Sunday school. Romans 6 says that we were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. In order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk, my favorite line in a baptism, in newness of life. Now, as we come to Christ through his word, as we hear about the gospel of Jesus, through the very words of God's Bible that he has given us, we can walk in a newness of life. We can walk with, with a, a, a secure foot. We don't have to be exhausted by the world around us. We don't have to be exhausted by the, the, the things that we do. Those sins in your life that you keep coming back to like a dog to its own vomit, you don't have to keep beating yourself up. I know that someone in here has done that this week. You've thought, I'm an idiot. I keep doing this. Why can't I stop? I just am so dumb. No, you're human. We have all done that. I do that all the time. Come back to my old sins and the old ways and look at myself and think I'm worthless. You're not. You're not. You're valuable to God. So valuable that he gave Christ to die for your sake. He loves you that much. There is nothing that he wants more than a relationship with you and a relationship with the people out there. We have a message of forgiveness right here in this book. We have a message of God's love to sinners. And as a side note, we should not keep this to ourselves. We should share it with the world. We should tell the world all of that. I've shared this story a few times, and, and I shared it um, decently enough because I think it's a powerful example of, of love in the Christian life. But there is a, a magician. I'm a nerd. I like watching magic on YouTube. So, you know, whatever. There's a magician out there called Pendulette. And you probably have seen him. It's Penn and Teller, right? One's huge and tall and talks a lot. And the other guy is small and never talks on stage. He does talk in real life, just not on stage. It's their little bit. Penn and Teller are avid atheists. They don't want anything to do with scripture. They think they're smarter than the smartest people in the world. They don't want to hear what you have to say about it. However, there was a time when a man came into their show and wanted to share the gospel with them. And they was called up on stage for a magic act. And he came up there and he gave them a Gideon Bible 
and said, I want you to have this. I want you to know that Jesus loves you, that he wants a relationship with you. He shared the gospel in front of thousands of people in this Las Vegas, which is not a nice, you know, sin city for a reason. He, he shared it in front of all these people and was booed and booed and booed. People were throwing stuff on stage. And, and after the show, Penn Jillette was asked about it. And he said, you guys are terrible for doing that, for booing him off the stage. That man cared about me well enough to try and share that with me. He said, I don't believe it. That's what he said because he's an atheist. But he loved me enough to try and convince me of it. We need to love people enough. Those people in your life, they need to know the word of God in their life. You may not know every, every sentence in here, every verse. You may not have a lot of this memorized. You may not be able to have that all memorized. But you do know what the blind man knew in John 9, that he was once blind, but now he can see. You have that. You know what Jesus did for you. Go and tell Go and share that with others because you love them. And yes, they might boo you off a stage. Yes, they might be upset with you at Thanksgiving and Christmas. Who cares? It is their soul on the line. If I saw one of my kids crossing a busy street, 32, we live right in front of it. If I saw my dog, I love my dog. If I saw him, I can't say this for Rachel, but if I saw the dog, crossing the street and there was a big truck coming I would run as fast as I can and tackle that little puppy out of the way I say puppy he's nine years old but I would tackle him out of the way that little seven pound dog and I would try and save his life everything I could do if it was my kid I would do it I wouldn't say ooh I'm being too rough I might hurt them they might die people in your life have a truck heading towards them. They're going to hell. And you're there. God has put you there. I firmly believe that. God has put you in their life to share what the gospel says to them. The word of the Lord is perfect. It revives the soul. You can save those people through the power of Christ. Do not hold back. It keeps going in verse 7. It says, The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. I just love this, that, that the word of God can make simple people like you and I have wisdom. There is more wisdom found in here than any textbook in a college course. There is more wisdom here found in these words than any lecture that you're going to ever hear ever in your life. And there's a lot of information. We are in an information age. You can Google anything. There's more information here. More wisdom, true wisdom here than Google has. And I mean that because you don't want to see what some things Google has to say and some things the Internet has to say. This is wisdom. This is truth. This, as, as 2 Timothy 3.15, is able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation. And then in James 1.5, it says that if any of you lack wisdom, who do you go to? Ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to you. Well, God doesn't just bestow on you this magical halo of wisdom. He gives you this, the tools to understand this. He opens your eyes to this. This is how you gain wisdom, is the word of God. The world out there is searching for something. They're searching for knowledge of of everything. They want to know how this world came to be, how to live in it, how to not be depressed, how to not be angry, how to not be this or that in any way they can. They, we are desiring that as a human race answers to the world's most common problems. And I'm telling you, it is not hard to find it in here. But this is the last place that Satan wants you to look. It's the last place that the flesh wants you to look. And so, so often, people, Christians included, will go into this depressive state, especially when it gets dark outside at 5 o'clock, let's be real, and you don't go to the Bible. And instead, you watch TV and mindless stuff 
filling your mind with other, thing, other things. But this is sure. This makes wise the simple. This gives you wisdom. This is good for you. It is right, as verse 8 says. The precepts of the Lord are right. They rejoice the heart, right? When we're talking about the heart being rejoiced, we're not just talking about encouragement, but an attitude, a whole attitude. The way you look at the world is different. When we talk about looking at the world in a Christian worldview, we're not just talking about an encouragement, but perspective. Jesus says in Matthew 11, to come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. But he wants you to abide in that rest. He wants you to stay in that rest. It's a perspective change. It's a, it's a mentality change. It's a change to where you are seeking the kingdom before all things. And so the world out there and the trifles that you experience don't matter as much anymore. The stress you have at your job, the stress you have driving to your job, the stress that you have just being a person in this world, it's not as important because you know Jesus, because you know his precepts, because they are right, they are sure, they are good. And what it says in, in the end of verse 8, the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The filthiness of this world is, is outstanding. It's, it's outstanding in a bad way. It is shocking, is it not? I made the joke this morning uh, about TVs bleeping out curse words. They don't do that anymore, right? The filthiness of language, but the filthiness of content as well. There are many shows that are, are, are acclaimed, heavily acclaimed shows that are just filthy in content, very sexually driven, um, very uh, just morbid, disturbing, and they do these things so that it's a shock value. But slowly in our minds, the, 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 the human mind, we become desensitized to these things. And we see a certain scene on Game of Thrones, and I mean, it's, I've never seen an episode, but it's, it's basically pornography, guys. And, and we see that, and then What's the harm in anything else? You've already seen it. You're desensitized to it. It's not as bad. It's the same reason why um, it, it's, the same, it, it's the same kind of drug addiction that we have when people take drugs or, or drink heavily. You, one, one doesn't do it enough. And so now you need two, and you need more, and you need more, and you desire more. And so when you're looking at the filth that's on television or on Netflix or whatever you're streaming, right, HBO Max is the worst, and, and you're looking at that filth, it doesn't do it anymore, and you need more of it. And you fill your lives with this, and, and it's, it's sick. But this, here, the word of God is pure. It is good. It is, um, it is something that can uh, change your perspective, open your eyes, enlighten your eyes to the world. You can go, I, I want you to know this, you can go your whole life without watching shows that are filthy like that. You can go your whole life without watching the things that are popular in this world because of things like that. I am, like I said, I'm a nerd. I love things like fantasy and all of that. Lord of the Rings, love it. I've never seen an episode of Game of Thrones because it's filthy. And I don't want that in my life. There are shows like that that aren't worth corrupting your mind over. This is pure. This enlightens your eyes. This shows you that perspective, gives you that new perspective on life. And it is beautiful. It is good. And it is strong so that we can have hope in this life. So we can have Joy in this life, joy that lasts, not joy in the sin that will be evaporated at the end of the days, joy that lasts in Christ. Look at, uh, look at verse 9 now, it talks more about cleanliness, it says the fear of the Lord is clean, and endures forever. We hear that all the time in, in scripture that uh, the 
grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord stands forever. We see that, that God's word will last till the end. And then when you fear God, when you are seeking him diligently in the word of God, that you will also endure forever, that that fear endures forever, that um, you will last alongside of those who are redeemed because you are seeking the Lord, because you fear him. And, and, and I just, I love this picture here because for us, we must be clean. For us, we must be holy, in other words, set apart from the common things of this world and, and made better. It is interesting in the mind of children what they deem worthy of being put on their bedside or on the fridge or not. And it is, um, they're not in here, so I'll tell on them. My kids like to draw and do crafts and to do all sorts of things out of um, basically garbage. And, and they'll take an old toilet paper roll, uh, you know, the tube, and make something out of it. And Hudson is the main culprit of this. He loves to create, he loves to make, he loves to form things out of, of otherwise trash. And some things he keeps and he'll be proud of. And he'll put it by his bedside and show it to me when I say goodnight to him at night. And he'll love it. All right? Um, some things he makes and then he just thinks, eh, I don't like it. And that throws it away. And I think it's just such an interesting thing what he likes and what he doesn't like and what he keeps and he doesn't keep. And I don't know the criteria in which he does that, but I know one thing is that it has to look a certain way. It has to be a certain way. It has to be neat. It has to be well put together, no tears, no marker issues where it faded out or anything. He's very particular. For us as humans, as creations of God, as Christians, we need to make sure that we are trying to be blameless before our Lord, that we are different than others. It doesn't mean that we're going to be perfect, because if you've ever seen a kid's craft, you know it's not perfect. But we are still valuable in God's eyes, and part of that is because we are following the standards that are set by Christ. And we're not perfect in those standards following them, but we strive for them. And he sets us apart. We can cry out with the psalmist in Psalm 51.10 saying, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. And then we can know that at the end of the day, we're not thrown in the trash with the, the, the stuff that has blemishes and tears and is broken down and didn't quite glue right or the tape doesn't hold. Instead, we can be set apart for God. We can be with him in his kingdom, as 1 John 2.17 says, the world is passing away with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. The fear of the Lord is clean, is what Psalm 19 says. It endures forever. When you are following the statutes, the law of the Lord, and you won't do it perfectly, God will hold on to you, will keep you close, will love you, and that's the promise that we have in the Holy Spirit. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit. We are always going to be his because he loves us. He cares for us. He created us. And it's something very special that we see. We see as well in, in verse 9, the rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Righteous is such an interesting word that we, we have in Scripture. You know, it's a legal term. And, and, you know, I'm not a lawyer, and, and I don't pretend to be one. <clears throat> but um, it's a legal term meaning that you are right in the eyes of the judge. Uh, so when God declares us righteous, when we see that the rules are, are righteous, when we obey those, when we follow Christ, the fulfillment of the law, we are now given that righteousness. And, and that righteousness is imputed to us on the cross of Christ where he took our place, where we should have died, he died, 
And he gave us his righteousness so we can be seen as right in God's eyes. Not a sinner, but right. Good. Just like how after God created the world, he declared things good. He saw it was very good. That's how we are after we come to Christ. Isn't that beautiful? The, the, the nature of that, we come back to start and we are made good again. We are right in God's eyes. And this is what, this is what um, Romans 3, 21 through 22 says about the righteousness of God, which I think is a very important thing to understand. The righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. The law bears witness to it. Uh, the law and the prophets bear witness to it. But the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. The righteousness of God is through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. So God himself comes to earth. The righteousness of God is made known. The law is inadequate to save you because you will fail at every point. You will break the law of God. The standard is too holy, too good. We cannot be that. We are not perfect. We will never be. And I want to make that very, very clear because I think there's misunderstandings in the American church that a Christian has to be perfect. We have churches that demand that in legalism, and we have people outside of the church that expect that. And I want to make this clear. I'm not perfect, and neither are you, and we will never be. And the, the aim is not to be perfect. The aim is to try and strive to be like Christ every which way we can. And Christ is the righteousness of God. And we are not perfect, but we are righteous. We are declared righteous by God because we have faith in Jesus Christ. We are given that righteousness in Romans 3 that we see there. We are given that righteousness on the cross and we are given that righteousness because the rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. So if you are people of the word, you are people who are made righteous in God's eyes. I love the fact that when we follow God's word, we are following his rules. We are following the law. We are following not just the, the letter of the law as in you must do this or do that. We are following the intent of the law to bring us to salvation in Christ. And when you are there, you are righteous. The beauty of Psalm 19 is this, that it reveals God in nature. It reveals God in, in, in Scripture. And it shows his glory. It shows his grace. And, and I just love that this, now, today, we get to look at Scripture because in the days to come, in the weeks to come before Christmas, we're going to see the Word made flesh. Right. We're going to see Christ, the righteousness, come to earth for you, for your sake. Scripture is not just rules that we follow. It's not just things that we do. Scripture is the very foundation for every Christian. Scripture is the rock on which we build our house. The scripture here is not just for, uh, for great life lessons. It's not just how to live life. It's not just how we, uh, a manual to study um, how to be a better person. That's not what scripture's for. Scripture is a foundation for every Christian because Scripture declares who God is. It is through this book that we have any relationship with our Creator, with the Creator that created the sun rises and sunsets, that, that the heavens declare the glory of. That God we see in Scripture. That is why Scripture is powerful. It is not basic instructions before leaving earth, as we so often say. It's so much more far more than that. Scripture is not about you at all, in fact. Scripture is all about God. And Scripture should give you the reaction that Isaiah and Isaiah 6 has to God. Woe is me! I'm unworthy of this God! We should look at the example of, of the, the Israelites all throughout redemptive history. Their ups and their downs. They're serving God. And then they're making golden calves at the bottom of the mountain of God. 
And we shouldn't look at them and say, what idiots, I'm good, I'm great. I'm a Baptist, I'm the best of the best. No, sorry, you're not. You're just like them. You are exactly like those Israelites. You want to know why I know you're exactly like them? Because I'm exactly like them. And man, I get on fire sometimes. I'm praising the Lord after he redeems us out of Egypt and the waters are parted and we see God working in our lives and we say, yes, God is good. But then when we're hungry in the wilderness and all we get are little scraps of manna from heaven, oh, we had life better in Egypt. We're just like the Israelites. We're just like the people in Scripture. We're just like the disciples that we say so often, what idiots. Oh my goodness, they are dumb sometimes. When you say that next time, remember you're saying it about yourself too. Because we do the same things. Scripture is not about you. It's about God. It's about the creator. It's about Jesus Christ. It's about what he's done. And then it expects you. You are expected when you hear God's word. I say this almost every Sunday. You are expected when you hear this word to respond to this word. Because this is God's word to you. And it's not a one-way conversation. This is God's word to you. And he wants you to repent. Wants you to react. Wants you to say something back. To do something about it. This is the foundation for every Christian. Verses 10 and 11 10 specifically shows how valuable it is it says it should be more desired than gold you know i don't own a lot of gold things i have this and a necklace right and and i wear them all the time but i have a gold ring it's a wedding ring i don't know how much i paid for this ring. it wasn't a lot guys i i don't like to spend money on things like that but we bought it when we we you know got married and and I usually wear a silicone one, to be honest. It, you know, it's rare to wear the gold one. But we should desire God's word more than the treasures of earth, more than money, more than gold, more than whatever else is valuable in this world. I don't even know what's valuable in this world anymore. Cryptocurrency or something? I don't know. I think that crashed or something. But still... Desire that. For you specifically in here, because we're all Americans, desire God's word more than the American dream. Because we may not want mansions and, and fancy cars. We may not want gold chains like the rappers wear or football players have. But we may just want that dream. Enough money to live comfortably a nice house with a nice white picket fence, and everything in our mind is perfect. But that's not reality. That's a lie. It doesn't happen. Nothing will ever be perfect in this world. For Christians here, this is the closest to hell we'll ever be. This is not going to be perfect for us. You'll get that perfect when you're in heaven. All of that is a trap that we follow and people strive for so much that they desire that over God. And so I hear all the time from uh, people my age, young families, that, oh yeah, they want to get back in church, it's just, you know, this is happening and they're trying to work for this and they're trying to make sure that they're doing this and doing that and you know, they work so much in the week, so Sundays are really the only day off that they have for their family. And I, I understand that. It sounds noble, but what, what I'm hearing is that they're, they're making idols of various things that may be not bad. They're not bad things, but they're not great. We're allowing good to become the enemy of great. The good thing, like a, the family going to the zoo on Sunday morning, or the family having a nice breakfast at Waffle House every day, you know, every weekend. Like, that's good. 
I'm glad that they're spending time with their family and not cheating on their wives or doing drugs in some, some place, right? That's a good thing. However, they're exchanging the good for the great because how much better is that family dynamic when they're all centered on Christ? They're missing out on the real thing behind it all. This is great. This is good. This is more valuable than gold. Even much fine gold is what he says. It is sweeter than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. I love eating honey. I love consuming honey and tea especially. It's sweet. It's delicious. It's one of the world's best uh, products that we have. It, it is literally nature's best product provided by our friends the bees. But this is sweeter. This is better. This is not given to us by nature. This is given to us by God who created everything in nature. This is sweeter and better. We should desire this over the, the, the food that we eat, over the things that we consume. And so when I'm talking about consumption, not just the things that we eat, not just the things we drink, not just the honey, but the other things we consume in our modern age, like television, desire this over that. Some of the guys here in the church were going over to a friend's house or a friend's church after, uh, after this to watch a football game and eat some wings and, and all of that. And, um, and you know what? Like, football is nothing compared to God's word. The NFL is just a game. It's meaningless. And, and, and if I ever choose to stay home to watch a 930 London game, or if you do, instead of coming to church, I think you'd notice if I was gone, but if you do, shame on you. This is better than anything you can consume out there. This is better than those cat videos you scroll through YouTube watching. This is better than anything you have because it is God's word. Psalm 119, 162, long chapter, says, I rejoice at your word as one who finds great spoil. This is everything in life. This is a foundation on which your life is built. This is a foundation on which every Christian must stand. If you do not spend time in the Word, listen here, if you have no desire, you never want to spend time in the Word. You never do spend time in the Word, not just for a season, but as a pattern over a long period of time, you just have no desire for this. You need to understand that you may be fooling yourself about your relationship with Christ. That doesn't mean that you're a horrible person or that you're not a Christian. I don't know. But it means that there's something that's not right with your relationship with God. And I'd love to talk to you about that so we can dissect it, we can understand it. Now, there are seasons in which I go through where it is laborious to open God's word and to read it and to study it because part of it is because I know that whatever it's going to, it's going to say to me is going to feel hard to do and I don't want to do hard things. None of us do, right? And, and so I, I avoid it. Shame on me and I repent of it. I spend time in prayer to God to give me that heart that wants to be in his word. Some of us have been years without cracking open their Bible at home. Some of you have been uh, going to church every Sunday for 50 years, but at home you've never opened your Bible before. Maybe to read a thing at Thanksgiving or Christmas for your kids. Maybe. If you don't have a relationship with God's word, you don't have a relationship with God. Imagine if I and and if I never ever listened to anything that my wife said to me. She would say it and I'd put in noise canceling headphones, never never hear it, don't want to hear it. There's no relationship there, guys. That's neglect. That's wrong. 
How many of us have been neglecting God by not listening to his word? This is the time to get into it. Because as, as verse 11 here says, by them, by your word, by your commandments, by your law, your servant is warned. This helps, and, and, and the idea of it is that it helps correct, it helps rebuke, it helps create a complete man of God, as 2 Timothy 3 says, by the word of God here, right? This word helps us do that, helps you become who you should be. This is a true sword as we see in, in Scripture. Jesus says he does not come to bring peace but a sword. In Hebrews 4.12, he says, the word of God is living and active, sharper than two, any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. God will know your heart. God knows it. You cannot hide it. You cannot fake being a Christian. You could fake it to all of us here. But when you get to heaven and you say, Lord, Lord, did I not go to church every Sunday? Did I not listen to Jamie preach all those times for nothing? And he's going to look at you and say, depart from me for I've never known you. If you are not in the word of God, you are not in God. If you are not listening to this, if you are not loving this, you don't love the Father. This is so important as the foundation of the Christian life. Don't misunderstand me. You will have seasons where it is hard to get into it. You will have seasons where it is difficult to open this Bible on your own. That's why the church exists. That's why we are here around you. So that you can, as verse 11 says, keep them and have a great reward. That reward is not just the reward in heaven. Yes, that's part of it. But the reward of this life now. The reward of learning more about your God before you see him face to face. The reward of being together with your church. To open this together. We have amazing opportunities at this church to get together and to spend time in God's word because we are people of the word. We are people of the book. We want to know Christ better. If you are not in God's word, it's time to get in God's word. If you don't have the foundation on which every Christian stands, your house will fall. We know that. It must be built on this rock must be built on Scripture alone. So I'm begging you, as we close out, to evaluate your own life, to evaluate the seriousness in which you hold Scripture. It's not just another book on your bookshelf. It is the book that you should be spending time in. And I love to read. I love to read books and novels and books about theology, and books about church ministry, and church of this, and church that, whatever. I like to read those. But there is no substitute for the word of God in our lives. Let's make a commitment together that today, if you have been slacking in this, and you know if you have, and I know it's difficult to ask, but let's make a commitment that if you have been having trouble in the word of God, that we will do better and you're not going to do it alone, that you're going to commit to each other here, that we can do it both in Sunday school, both in getting together throughout the week, one-on-one, -on -one. we can get together in homes or, or just at any times, at things like WMU that we have. Those are opportunities for you to get into the Word and jumpstart your spiritual life in a way that maybe you, you felt deficient in. God wants that relationship with you just as he desires it with all others. He wants you to continually grow in that relationship. Every day since I've been married to Rachel, there is a commitment of love that grows. It's not just merely, uh, well, I love you just the same way as I loved you 10 years ago. That's not very romantic. 
No, love you more every day. In our relationship with God, let's commit to that, that we will love him more every day. For he's worthy of that. And his word is good and it's in front of us. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the goodness that you have given us in your word. God, you have shown us the most amazing parts of you revealed to us in scripture. Lord, you have shown us your glory in nature, but you have shown us grace in your word. You have shown us who Christ is. You have shown us our salvation. You have shown us our unworthiness before you and the righteousness that you offer. God, today, as we make a commitment together, <clears throat> let us commit to opening your word, to spending time in your word, and to desiring you above all else, to not make excuses any longer. Lord, we are given gifts. The first gift is the word of God, the canon of scripture before us. The second gift is the spirit within us to understand this. And the third gift is the church around us to encourage and to help us grow. Lord, let us grow. Let us commit. Let us love one another. Let us also love you. You are good. You are precious to us. It's in Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. It's at this time uh, that we have a time of response to God's word. Like I said, every time God speaks, in his word, he expects us to react. And every time I, I preach and preach from the word, God expects you to respond. I've already given you the response that we should make to respond as a commitment to his word. To not just sit idly by as a word, it sits and collects dust, but instead dive into it and love it. So please stand and let's sing, I need thee every hour. And make that commitment together. I'm going to stand here. If you want to talk about what it means to follow Jesus, what it means to um, join the church or be baptized, this is a time to talk about that and, and, and make your, your commitment known before the people of God. But um, additionally, if you want to just pray with me, I want to share those burdens with you. So let's go ahead and sing, I Need Thee Every Hour. Like thine can peace afford. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. I need thee every hour. Stay thou nearby. Temptations lose their power when thou art nigh. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. I need thee every hour in joy or pain. Come quickly and abide, or life is vain. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come. Thee. I need the every hour, most holy one. Oh, make me thine indeed, thou blessed son. 
I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee, oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. Amen, and praise the Lord. Uh, this is the end of our worship service, but it's not the end of worship because in all we do, we glorify our God. Um, our benediction today comes from 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 16 and 17. This is what God's word says to us. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. It is in that comfort of Christ, that eternal comfort that we have through Jesus, that you are sent out into the world as missionaries. Follow the example of wonderful women like uh, Lottie Moon that we learned about today and, and give, it, give God your all. Thank you so much for being here. It's a blessing to be your pastor. Love you all. You are dismissed and you are sent.